It's advanced sci-fi civilizations too stupid to really exist. And thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode. So bust out the fine china and make sure you zhuzh up your quiff for the swankiest of stupid advanced civilizations we've encountered yet. It's Panem from the Hunger Games film series. It's another movie franchise inspired by a tweeny novel series. Basically Twilight with the vampires and mythical beasts swapped out for a dystopian regime, copious amounts of child murder and genetically modified beasts. What? We join our heroine, Cattiness, a rebellious teen who rages against any and all authority figures on her accidental quest to overthrow the government and keep two guys at arm's length for as long as humanly possible. In between manic bouts of obsession over selfish personal issues in the middle of a devastating war. Kino was the one who was supposed to live. Panem is a totalitarian, borderline fascist, semi-feudal state, rounded off with a few attributes from ancient Rome. Most notably, their use of gladiatorial combat as a political tool and the name of the country itself. Apparently inspired by the Latin phrase Panem et Kirkansis, or in English, bread and circuses. That's right, it's bread. Your country's name is bread. Oh. <laughs> A fairly ironic name considering the state fails to meet the basic needs of its citizens. And they should have kept the circus part of the phrase not just because of the Hunger Games, but because this country is absolutely full of clowns. Point 1. Panem is extremely vulnerable to disruption, with a government hell-bent on provoking a revolution. As is typical for many dystopian regimes, Panem was established in the aftermath of global catastrophe, this time in the form of conflict and numerous ecological disasters. Positing itself as a rational response to these events, the capital rules the other districts with an iron fist, forcing these isolated populations to provide the capital elites with all the goods they need and want, supposedly in exchange for law, order and stability. Each district supplies the capital. In return, the capital provides order and security. But in reality, the capital and outer districts have a relationship that is parasitic in nature, known as a command economy in our world reminiscent of North Korea. Each district produces an extremely limited class of goods or services, with the market and incomes tightly controlled by the government. District 10 providing livestock, District 11 agricultural products, and Katniss's District 12 supplying coal. Because apparently this advanced sci-fi civilization still requires copious amounts of fossil fuels. Fuels. Who knew? This system has likely been designed this way to prevent any of the districts being able to operate autonomously and potentially secede from the unholy union. But this state order creates a far greater risk than the one it possibly seeks to prevent. Their extreme lack of diversification leaving the capital highly vulnerable to natural disasters, labor strikes and other civil unrest. Any of these scenarios could cut the capital off from essential supplies such as power, water and food, leaving them all but crippled. Add to this their heavy reliance on a rail system for shipping, a form of transit that is easily disrupted due to the tracks being mostly situated in vast areas of remote wilderness, and the likelihood of disaster is drastically increased due to the administration seemingly doing everything in their power to encourage rebellion, perhaps to a greater degree than any civilization we've previously dealt with. While the fashionistas of the capital enjoy a lavish lifestyle and the inner district's special treatment, the majority of the the districts and their populations live in abject poverty, with extremely limited freedoms and subjected to regular brutal oppression, forced into labor camps pumping out food products for the decadent elites while they themselves go starving, and deprived of many of their other needs such as reliable electricity. Unemployment appears to be rampant in some districts, the local economy stifled by the forbidding of inter-district trade and travel, and the severe limiting of business activity. So guys, if you want your business to exist without limits, be sure to build yourself a website with Squarespace. Whether you're creating a page for an existing business, an e-commerce site, consolidating your portfolio or starting a blog, Squarespace is an all-in-one platform delivering all the tools you need to build a slick looking, functional website and run your business. Just pick a suitable template, select from the range of features that best suit your website, then have a play around with all the different fonts, colors, spacing and background options. The interface is very user friendly, but if you're so inclined, you could further customize your website 
website using the inbuilt CSS editor. No matter what design options you go for, you can be assured your website will automatically adjust to fit the device it's been viewed on. You'll also benefit from Squarespace's analytics and other business management tools, including a range of helpful third-party extensions. So guys, if you're ready to bring your vision to life, check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're set to go live, visit squarespace.com slash mediazealot to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So anyway, with finite jobs available, many in Panem's population are seemingly left to fend for themselves. Forced to scavenge food in an unsuitable suburban environment, they have no choice but to break the rules in order to follow a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. In Panem, following the rules is likely to be a death sentence. It doesn't help that the government regularly shifts the goalposts, inventing new laws on the fly, failing to enforce some existing laws while severely enforcing others. Fall afoul of this unpredictable system and you can expect severe punishments such as flogging, mutilation and execution. Cut out our tongues or worse. You'll be subjected to mandatory propaganda which must seem ridiculous considering the state's activities. It's hard to buy into Panem being a pinnacle of law and order and the last bastion of hope for humanity when the state are the obvious aggressors failing to deliver any certainty. You'd be more concerned with where your next meal is coming from. And all of this is going on in a country with an extremely tiny population no greater than four 4.5 million, living in an area only slightly smaller than the existing USA with vast areas of undeveloped wilderness. There's room to grow around here, I can't see any pressing need to be so restrictive and harsh. Although the upper classes receive better treatment in general, even they can be mistreated depending on the whims of their dictator. Finnick, a victor who is meant to be afforded special status, is subjected to sexual slavery. If a victor is considered desirable, the president gives them as a reward or allows people to buy them. If you refuse, I mean, kill someone you love cultural elite or not, do anything to upset or disappoint the leadership and you can count on being mutilated or murdered. Sorry, suicided. Given the decor, it, it seems somehow excessive. But perhaps the strongest method by which the capital invites rebellion has to be the Hunger Games itself, though it supposedly exists to prevent it. Supposed to serve as a display of state power and a tool of distraction, all the Hunger Games end up doing is fueling unrest year upon year, especially in the more disadvantaged districts. Built as a response to a rebellion that occurred 75 years ago rather than improving societal conditions to shore up morale. The capital instead decided the most logical solution was to annually round up one boy and one girl from each district between the ages of 12 and 18 and force them to fight to the death in an arena, with one declared the victor. But with the majority of kiddies usually killed in the first three hours, the Hunger Games quickly de-evolves into a boring survivalist reality TV drama. Teens having arguments, bullying each other, toying with their crushes, a bit of bird calling, peculiar arts and crafts, but mostly hanging around in trees for long periods of time. It's basically a Lord of the Flies inspired camping trip. The competition itself, like their society, is patently unfair, pitting underdeveloped children against mentally and physically superior late teenagers, strong males against young girls, trained killers versus novices, the career tributes who win most years, often training for their entire lives and benefiting from superior resources before volunteering for the competition, taking on other contenders who are completely out of their depth and may not have prepared much at all, certain competitors receiving more help than others due to them being popular. The state can also choose to kill anyone at any time. Rather than preventing subversive thought, all the Hunger Games accomplish is to make the state's pointless brutality far more apparent. The copious child murder risks triggering some of our most basic protective instincts, primal responses which tend to negate our fear of personal harm. Meanwhile, the more humane and selfless of the tributes are given a massive platform from which to provide a strong contrast to the callousness of the state. I can see nothing at all about the Hunger Games which would invoke a healthy fear. Instead, it seems to me it could only breed extreme resentment. An annual reminder that around here, the real Hunger Game is just everyday life. In Panem, insurrection isn't just highly likely, for many it would become a necessity. Weighing the likelihood of harm under normal societal conditions versus the likelihood of being harmed during an attempt at rebellion, the logical choice is obvious. At least when you're risking yourself for a cause, the violence could potentially end. But where to start? Overthrowing an entire system can be pretty daunting. Well, luckily for aspiring subversives, the capital not only provides the motivation, they'll deliver you all the tools you need to get this thing off the ground.
Point two, Panem provides a pipeline for rebel talent, allowing highly skilled revolutionaries to infiltrate every level of their society. Their tolerance of District 13 escalates a rebellion into a full-scale war. So we enter the fray with Katniss, a typical starving teenager who volunteers to take the place of her younger sister during the annual Hunger Games reaping, whisked away to the capital and assigned a previous victor, Haymitch, as a mentor, who deals with his obvious trauma and complacency within the system by drowning himself in liquor. Over the course of two Hunger Games, the state supplies Katniss with a series of mentors, most with pretty obvious subversive tendencies. Even Effie is a rebel sympathizer in denial, hiding her disdain for the system behind an obsession with pomp and ceremony. These mentors train Katniss and many other tributes with all the skills they need to attempt to survive the Hunger Games and navigate the political world of the capital, which is conveniently the exact same skill set required to meaningfully challenge the authority of the government. You'll learn proficiency with weaponry, military tactics, survival skills, and, uh, camouflage? In terms of the battleground of the mind, you'll become knowledgeable in public relations strategies, political networking, and maneuvering. It is a time when instinct and emotion dominate over reason. Before the Hunger Games begin, you'll be wheeled out for some fancy cocktail parties. Now's your chance to curry favor with the elites. Or considering you're probably going to die anyway, you may choose to start your murderous rampage right now and take out as many of these pretentious dicks as possible. Hell, they might even give you a crack at the leader. Should you survive the Hunger Games, you'll come out of this thing a ruthless murder machine, adept at manipulating public opinion, with a likely hatred of the government that subjected you to this campaign of abuse. You'll then be partially integrated into upper class society and given a massive political platform to take advantage of. They've created a powerful, subversive class of people and getting rid of them now presents a massive political risk. Granted, few survive the culling process, but enough of these people have built up over the years to become an extremely viable threat. And let's not discount the possibility that some of these damaged children could become criminals or perhaps even serial killers. It may not just be a rebellion you have to deal with. With. Even beyond the scope of the victors and the mentors, the capital seems to have subversives operating at every level of government. They're like a good guy version of Hydra, just waiting for someone to properly organize them. As with most dictatorships, the political system of Panem is vulnerable to coups and corruption. President Snow himself seizing power by way of killing his opponents and critics. Surrounded by an elitist class of business owners who have been afforded massive power and influence in their own right. Even before the dark societal morale, poor infrastructure, and other insurrection-provoking activities. It was already a fragile system, vulnerable to infiltration or just organic collapse. So secret rebel leader Plutarch, a high-ranking aristocrat, comes back out of retirement to manage the 75th Hunger Games and covertly assist Katniss and the rebellion, leading us to find out the rebel leadership is far more powerful than we could have imagined. District 13, supposedly wiped out in the first rebellion 75 years ago, is far from gone. They're a well-organized, legitimately powerful military force with military hardware that rivals that of the capital. They've been training all this time, dedicating their lives to the coming war for Panem. Though in the movies, we don't get much insight into how such a large population could survive underground and avoid the scrutiny of the capital. The books do shed some light on this. District 13 was originally the primary military provider for Panem, supplying military hardware to the capital, and most concerningly, nuclear weaponry. To be frank, it doesn't really sound like stuff that should be outsourced, especially when the suppliers could easily become a threat. So inevitably, District 13 rebelled against the capital's oppression, a war that ended in a nuclear stalemate and a non-aggression pact. Though mutually assured destruction can't be offered as an excuse for movie Panem's tolerance of District 13, it's safe to assume the capital did at least know of their survival, launching a surprise attack on their facilities with Al McCoy suggesting they may be working off old information. Capital's working off some outdated information. I'd rather not update it for them. Which either means they knew this place existed all along, or they failed to confirm the kills 75 years ago and never bothered to sniff around again. Whatever the case, the support from District 13 allows a smoldering rebellion to escalate into a full-scale war between rival states, easily aligning with the swaths of rebel sympathizers pulling the strings behind the scenes, seemingly without any challenge or investigation from the capital. 
capital. They seek to refine and weaponize Katniss's unadulterated teenage angst, aiming it like a missile towards the capital. And unsurprisingly, the state's response to these events is about as good as their food rationing. Point three, President Snow's lackluster response to widespread rebellion assures his administration's ultimate collapse. So here we are again, another villainous dictator plagued by arrogance and overconfidence, this time it's the President Snow Show. The guy fancies himself a supreme political strategist, when in reality he's just memorized a bunch of quotes from Panem's version of The Art of War. Hope. It is the only thing stronger than fear. President Snow suggests some of Panem's policies can be explained as attempts to implement a degree of state-managed dissent. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. But without controlling the process from start to finish, like say Ng Sok from 1984, it's inevitable that this supposedly contained hope will run away from you. Snow is just the latest in a long line of authoritarian dictators. He may not deserve the blame for everything wrong with their system, but he's still its greatest champion. And as his strategic shortcomings are quickly laid bare, it's obvious he's ultimately responsible for this current mess. So first off, considering the extreme political importance of the Hunger Games, think Snow should at the very least be offering some supervision over the operation. But nope, it's all on Seneca Crane. And this guy just seems a bit vacant in general. Spark is fine, as long as it's contained. So... So... Contain it. Predictably making a rookie error, leaving Katniss and Peter alive after their defiant suicide pact. If that head game maker Seneca Crane had had any brains at all, he would have blown you to bits then and there. This is part of a trend in which Snow delegates extremely important work to others, offering little in the way of oversight and then using them as a patsy to blame everything on when the shit hits the fan. Shall I flog them as well? This could be part of a political strategy designed to distance the leadership from failure and unethical activities, commonly seen in democracies where re-election is a concern. Never let them see you bleed. But maintaining the integrity of your image becomes thoroughly pointless if you're allowing your subordinates to bring the country to ruin. You're not off to a real good start. And just because some other guy shows up for the cameras and takes the fall for you doesn't mean you can't be involved in all the important decision making. He's missed half the point of his own strategy. Why are you here then? And it's not like he's got anything better to do, he's usually just fluffing around in his rose garden. Snow attempts to wrap things in a bow by making Crane suicide himself. But if anything, that just adds to the political damage. He then tries to quell the growing unrest caused by Katniss and Peter's stunt by recruiting them as PR agents before their grand victor tour. You need to smile. You need to be grateful. But above all, you need to be madly prepared to end it all in love. You think you can manage that? A whirlwind trip around the districts, giving Katniss and Peter an extended political platform and a bunch of networking opportunities. Genius. It's just so obvious this whole thing should have been canned. Maybe stick to pre-recorded propaganda. These people only needed a nudge to rebel. Katniss practically didn't need to say or do much of anything to rack them up. Plutarch then pulls a fast one on Snow, justifying Katniss's continued survival and duping him into strategies that seem designed to spark a full-blown rebellion as opposed to quelling one. I agree she should die, but in the right way. At the right time. Shut down the black markets, take away what little they have, then double the amount of floggings and executions, put them on TV, broadcast them live. It doesn't help that Snow seems somewhat sentimental towards Katniss, perhaps subconsciously reluctant to take her out, possibly reminded of his granddaughter. I also get the sense he's relishing having a true political opponent to deal with. Not a great time to get all misty-eyed when the primary focus should be stomping the shit into the ground. That's not good enough. She's an agitator. So they start brutalizing the residents of District 12, their only crime producing Katniss and doing a three-finger salute before it was even frowned upon. Nice. Way to make friends out there. Eventually forced to alter the rules of the Hunger Games in an effort to snuff out the ever-growing threat of Katniss's celebrity. The male and female tributes are to be reaped from the existing pool of victors. He even considers killing all previous victors. The other victors. Now because of her, they all pose a threat. 
both of which seem like measures that would destroy the intended hope fostering effect of the Hunger Games, further galvanizing the population against their oppressive rulers and extending a political platform to Katniss yet again, who by this point has had her disdain for the capital transformed into an all-consuming, burning hatred. Not to mention all the other victors who were also rightfully livid. So these famous beloved people are given a chance to air their grievances live on air. The Court of Crow were written into law by men, certainly it can be unwritten. Perhaps just this once they should have foregone all the public showcasing and got down to the rebel culling. And even after the mess of the last Hunger Games, these absolute morons still haven't built in a delay, allowing Peter to pull off this impressive move. I wouldn't have any regrets at all if it weren't for the baby portraying the capital as the heartless monsters they truly are. So at this time of massive instability, Snow once again delegates the important task of managing the Hunger Games. He's at least making some sort of effort this time, taking a shift or two, but he's still not paying attention closely enough to notice some suspicious behavior from this Plutarch guy. Unsurprisingly, half the victors have joined the rebellion movement before being dropped in the arena, successfully protecting Katniss long enough for her to take advantage of a weakness in the force field. Plutarch's apparent autonomy then allowing him to win Katniss for the rebellion in a claw game. Events that escalate widespread unrest into a legitimate revolution. You electrified the nation. There have been riots and uprisings and strikes in seven districts. The government then responds by completely wiping out District 12, like that'll help. But it's no use. Who the hell is gonna mine your coal now? They're bombing hospitals and killing people willy-nilly, giving our PR savvy rebel leaders loads of good ammunition. They also bring in harsher labor conditions in other districts. By order of President Snow, daily production quotas have been increased. When these people were no doubt already on the verge of dropping their tools. Meanwhile, the Capitol newsfeed seems to be extremely prone to hijacking. And even when they do manage to maintain control, they're wheeling out Peter looking more and more sickly with each appearance, like that would convince anyone of anything. And yep, still no delay. They're coming, Kenneth. They're gonna kill everyone. And in District 13, you'll be dead by morning! District 13 now launches their campaign in earnest, going after a supposedly advanced military base they've nicknamed the Nut. And all you need to do to bust it is create an avalanche, which kind of defeats the purpose of having your base underground. What, it can't handle a few bombs? And it doesn't help that the capital is heavily reliant on this hydroelectric facility in District 5, which is only defended by a small handful of guards. Snow eventually allows a now brainwashed Peter to escape in an effort to assassinate Katniss. But since the psychological programming doesn't seem very foolproof, in reality you've just given a valuable PR asset back to the enemy. So with the capital now under assault, Snow resorts to deploying a bunch of Hunger Games S traps around the city. Does he realize this is real life now? Though I suppose their games technology is the preferable choice since their military hardware seems fairly rudimentary. And while we're on the subject, for pity's sake, would somebody please get this girl a gun? I understand this is a rebel PR campaign, but surely it couldn't hurt to have something to fall back on. That is mahogany. So after blowing up one building and failing to confirm the kill, Snow seems shocked to discover Katniss isn't actually dead. May we presume that this conflict is also responsible for the weakening of your powers. And note how Snow appears to enter his death spiral the moment he thinks Katniss is gone. It is her. <laughs> the dude's practically in love. It's the things we love most destroy us. Acting far too late to defend an underground tunnel network by deploying these ineffective creatures. Suitable enough for a horror movie or the Hunger Games, but pretty inadequate in terms of lethality. Though I will give them credit for seemingly modeling these creatures on the pasty gluttonous capital citizens who normally live above. If only they'd chosen to breed an army of more effective creatures far earlier, they could have had this war done and dusted. I'm afraid there's no longer time for that. So with a massive grassroots uprising on their hands, as well as having to take Take on a professional and well-armed military force. It appears the writing is on the wall for Snow. Embrace the probability of your imminent death. Thoroughly outplayed by Panem's next apparent dictator, Coin. But hey, if a rebel hovercraft only needs to chuck on a few decals to fly right over your capital building unimpeded, I think it's pretty much over already. Which begs the question why Coin bothered with this politically risky move at all. The idea that I was bombing our own helpless children to hold back the rebels? 
It turned the last of my guards against me. Seeking to continue the stupidity of Panem in more ways than one, she is rightfully assassinated by Katniss. Quinn could recognize Katniss as a threat to her power, yet she's standing within range of her bow. Snow technically getting the last laugh, though that won't stop the mob from ripping him apart in fitting fashion. And just FYI, in regards to our sordid little love triangle, it's underdog Peter who gets the win. He locked that shit down thanks to a cheeky assist from Hamish and the government and a bit of trauma bonding. So Panem effectively ends as we know it and begins the transition towards democracy and all it really took to defeat this advanced sci-fi civilization was one girl and her bow and arrow subscribe to get that girl a gun and don't forget to like the mockingjay